Robert, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure, Tom. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here and uh, take part in this discussion. So a um, little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior. You know, I'm 67 years old, believe it or not. So I could probably be your father. Um, <laughs> Uh, I always like to get that out of the way first. So um, going to some respect for my opponent, at least. Um, I am a father of a wife and 11 children, believe it or not. So I've been pretty busy in my life. My vocation um, is both in science and theology and uh, mostly biblical exegesis. So I've just gotten done a four volume commentary on the New Testament, a uh, total of about 3,000 pages that goes heavily into the original languages. So that's what I spend my time doing. I, I've written about 50 different books over the last 30 uh, some odd years and um, four different publishers. And I do lecturing all over the world nationally and internationally i uh, have debates as i do with you uh, i don't know if this is be a debate a formal debate uh, most of my debates have been formal and they have taken place over the last 30 years also on different topics uh, i've been on radio tv i've made my own movie that was in hollywood uh, what about seven years ago called the principal um, we had some the, the best scientists in the world uh, in that movie talking about cosmology and the origin of things, so, something probably you would like. Um, <clears throat> I've made three other movies in DVD. And what else do I do? Um, I take questions and answers on a program I have every week for two hours from patrons of mine. And... Um, Anything I can do to promote the faith, pr promote Christianity, uh, the Catholic version of it, and um, that's what I do. So that's what you have tonight. Cool. Um, I am an atheist, by which I mean I believe that all of the evidence is best explained by naturalism as opposed to theism. Could you tell me some of the reasons that indicate theism? Well, let me start by saying that I don't believe there are any atheists in the world. Um, I, I start from a presuppositional apologetic, you might say, that says uh, any man who denies God, God's existence is, is either fooling himself or a liar or is afraid to mention it or is unsure of himself. But deep down in his heart, he does believe God exists. And the reason for that is what St. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, which is every man no matter who he is sees the creation sees the complexity of nature sees how it's all put together how it all works beautifully together uh, every day the same thing sun rises and like clockwork um, he sees the intricacies of nature just look inside a tree or a plant or you know you know cut open a human body and you'll see the complexity and the design uh, of it all. And you know, by just looking at it, that somebody bigger and better than you had to put it together to make it work and continue to work. And, <clears throat> and God says in, in Romans chapter one, that it's so clear, so definitive, that every man will be without an excuse when he stands before God at judgment day and God takes account of his sins and either rewards him or damns him. That's how clear it is. That's how clear the message is. And God admits that, yeah, I'm invisible. Can't see me, can't feel me, can't touch me. Um, the only way that you can know I exist is by looking at the world and knowing that somebody has to be behind it. And that's it, period, end of stop. You know, there, there's nothing more to it to say. And if you don't accept that, that's your problem. So that's my position. Sure. So you mentioned a few things there. One was the fine tuning argument that seemed to be like the main 
position. And when I see all the evidence of fine tuning around it, I don't see any evidence of a God that doesn't make sense to me how the complexity of the fine tuning indicates a God. I don't see how that follows in the form of an argument because if uh, complexity is essentially take the fine tune of physics, the fact that if any of the constants of physics were changed even slightly, there wouldn't be a life in the universe. So it's like a dice with a billion sides and one red side. And the fact that we see it on the red side is the fine tuning. But if that's the case, then it seems like God has to be equally as much fine tuned because there are equally as many ways a God could be and equally as few ways a God would pr produce a life permitting universe. So, for example, there could be a God who could want every possible kind of universe. So for all the possible kinds of ways a universe could be, there could be a God who wants each different version. So a God who wants a universe of only puppies or only hydrogen atoms or only black holes. And so for a God to create a life permitting universe, the God itself must be finely tuned to desire a life permitting universe. Therefore, the fine tuning would apply to the God at the very minimum to the same degree as the universe, which seems to undercut the argument because the whole point is to explain this statistical improbability of why is there so much gray area and only one little red speck. Yet when we look at God, we see the same phenomenon. And so it seems like that isn't, it doesn't positing a God just kicks the can down the road. It doesn't seem to answer the question of the fine tuning um, because who fine tuned God. And it seems like we could posit a better explanation there and say it's uh, there's some determining law of physics that we just haven't discovered yet. And that would seem to answer the question better than a God would. All right. So basically what you did with my argument is you turned it around to something that you're comfortable with. And that is you took my, thesis about the existence of nature and of things that exist, and you turn that into a complexity argument. So that tells me that you've been here before, and you, what you do is you're going to categorize someone's argument and say, okay, well, this best fits into the complexity argument, so let me deal with it from there. I'm not arguing the complexity argument. I'm not arguing, you know, the irreducible things, the, the 20 equations that they have that make the universe run. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that they exist at all. Okay. That is the difference. You can, you can have in another universe, if you want, you can talk about 20 other different equations that run that universe. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is that something exists. Okay. Where did that come from? Okay. So that sounds like the cosmological yeah. argument. Well, wait, let me, let me go on here. Um, you also said that you can have a different set of parameters, rules, whatever you call them, and you could have a different universe made by a different kind of God. That, again, is not what, what I'm arguing about. It doesn't make any difference what universe you have. You have a universe. That's the thing you have to confront. So, like, you know, all these people talk about the multiverse and all that kind of stuff. They haven't even dealt with the universe they live in yet to deal with, you know, the, the, the complexity of the multiverse, you see. So that argument goes nowhere. And the other thing you said, well, who fine-tuned God? Okay, so now you hit on something that makes sense because the definition of God would be someone who doesn't have to be fine-tuned. That's who God is, the one who doesn't have to be fine-tuned. If he has to be fine-tuned, then obviously he can't be God. You see, so that argument, you just undercut yourself, I believe, by asking the very question, who fine tuned God, which means you really don't understand how far back it goes. It goes back to the point where he doesn't have to be fine tuned. OK, so to me, that seems like uh, circular reasoning literally just doesn't work at all. So like, I can just define the universe as a thing that can't be fine tuned. And then you can say, well, if we just look at the constants, I can imagine them otherwise. Therefore, it seems like there's other plausible ways it could be. And there's no Good. logic. I didn't say the universe can't be fine tuned. You just said that. No, no, I, I said that. So, I said that. So, so I said, oh. you claiming that God cannot be by definition fine tuned. I can simply do the same thing. I can claim by definition the universe can't be fine tuned. But that's just me no, making up a definition. You can't do that. Because the universe can't come into existence by itself. Sure, but neither can God. Oh, well, how do you know that? Because there's no evidence it can. There's no evidence that it can't. And if you're going to follow the progression back, you're going to have to admit 
somewhere along the line that there has to be a big a, a being that did not have a beginning necessary being. otherwise yeah. your argument doesn't make any sense whatsoever right, right. so I'm, I'm claiming the necessary being is better explained by like a quantum field or a thing in the universe a thing a part of the universe not a thing we have no evidence for so, so basically all you're doing is switching names you're going to call well, God a quantum field, and then you're going to assume a quantum field is going to fluctuate enough to give you this universe. Well, no, you two, two the things there. Two, two things there. One, this isn't conscious, so there's no evidence of any non-physical consciousness there. So quantum fields are things that we have evidence for, and we have evidence that they're close to the base of reality. We have no, no evidence of a non... One sec, one sec, one sec, let me finish. Okay. So, we have no evidence of a non-physical mind ever of any kind ever existing, much less one that created the universe. And so if we're trying to say what is more likely to be the fundamental nature of reality, say in a quantum field, which we have lots of evidence for, seems to be a much better explanation than a God, which we have essentially no evidence for. So I agree there has to be some fundamental nature of reality that grounds everything. But I think that the better explanation for that is a natural one, like a quantum field, which is a composite of principles, particles, and laws we've proven exist, as opposed to a God, which is a combination of principles and properties that we have no evidence at all, like omniscience, omnibenevolence, consciousness, perfect morality, uh, non-physicality, all those things. There's no evidence of any of those things, but we have lots of evidence of all the quantum yeah, stuff. Well, first of all, there's a reason why um, you don't see it. But before I get to that, let me get to your quantum field. You're you're putting all the burden, all the pressure on this quantum field, like it's going to some magic is going to answer all your questions. It's not okay. The quantum field is a random field that cannot be predicted what it's going to do from one millisecond to the next. Okay, people like Lawrence Krauss would like it to be the beginning of everything to say that we that matter, the whole existence came out of nothing but actually it's not nothing. It's really energy and matter that's in a quantum fluctuation that he has no way of predicting what it's going to do. Okay. So that's not going to answer your question for you. And unless question? you want to base something on pure chance and say that this random movement of quantum particles is going to produce me and you talking tonight. Is that what, where you want to hang your hat? What question doesn't it answer? I'm not following. What question it doesn't answer? How does randomness create thinking human beings that can argue back and forth as intelligent as we are from a, a sort of when they, from a massive random processes that ha cannot be predicted where they're going to go in the first place. Well, it could be determined. I don't need to say it's randomness, but if it's random, it's if there's some spectrum of possible constants and it is there's a percent chance that it randomly lands on the correct one that would also answer the question but i'm not seeing how that would be a worse explanation than a non-physical mind because it seems like if we have some kind of a system that we know has randomness in it and we have evidence that this thing is a real thing then positing this as an explanation seems better than if we posited leprechauns or unicorns something we yeah. have no evidence uh, yeah because i don't believe in leprechauns either right. Exactly. So, but the diff it seems like if you're saying God did it, that's equally as plausible as leprechauns or unicorns because there's equally as much evidence, as far as I can tell, for God as there is for leprechauns. No, so that's this quantum just not true. It's just well, not that's, true. That's great. That's great. So, you, you I, I'd love to hear the reasons. One second, one second, it doesn't one, make one. it right. Okay. Right. That's you can totally reject the statement and give me evidence to differentiate the two, and that would be great. But my argument here is that, to, from my perspective, it seems like a quantum field, because we have lots of evidence this is a real thing, is a more plausible explanation than something like leprechauns, which we have no evidence of as being a yeah, real But thing. I'm not arguing leprechauns. So don't try to caricature my position by keeping uh, referring to leprechauns. So, so just okay? to clarify, from my position, I see no difference between your position and leprechauns. I'm not saying you're arguing for leprechauns. I'm saying from the atheist position, we can't see a difference between God and leprechauns. They well, seem then to you're be... not very smart because you know okay. leprechauns don't have the power to create the world that we see. How do you know that? Okay. There's no evidence that they don't. No evidence that they don't. So you're going to play this game all night. Well, that's uh, what you I'll said. make I'm, an assertion and you're going to say, well, there's no evidence that it isn't the opposite way. And then you think you've you've satisfied yourself that you've advanced the, the, the tokens down the board. And now you can be self-satisfied that nobody's been able to refute you. All you're doing is playing a game. 
Well, I was copying your previous statement because that's what you said. Um, remember when I said, uh, I forget what the context was, but you specifically said there's no evidence that there isn't. That was, I was literally just mirroring your argument. That's my style. I, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what well, argument are you talking about? Earlier in the conversation, yeah. you were talking about something and you said there's no evidence he could be otherwise, I think is what the, what you were taught, what we were talking about. And so there's no evidence against. No, 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 no. I, you've got me totally confused. Okay. I, I'm not using a double negative on my assertion that God exists. I said God exists because no one other than a supreme intelligent being could make what we see. If that clarifies it for you more. Okay. So that seems just obviously not a leprechaun. Well, I don't see the problem. I don't see the difference there. Like you saying God can do it. You can make that assertion, but it seems clearly possible there are other alternatives here. I don't see the logical necessity between a God creating the universe. A leprechaun, if it was powerful enough, could definitely create the universe as we see it. Quantum field well, could do yeah, it. It's a big word, if he was powerful enough. But that's the same thing I'm saying for the God that I'm saying right. created the universe. Right. I'm granting it. So I'm, I'm granting God the could be powerful. God there would, it, at this point, it's not going to make any difference because I've caught you in your use of leprechaun to try to caricature my idea of a God creating a universe. You know, that didn't get you no. out of the argument just by saying that it could be a leprechaun. That doesn't deal with the fact that you have a very complex universe in which you wake up every morning and you eat your breakfast, and when you do, it goes into your digestive tract and into your bloodstream and gives energy to your cells so that your brain can think. And then you go to your work and you, you whatever you do for a living, you plow through it and you do all this stuff. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. That's okay, I'm, I'm lost a little bit here. So, so I just want to clarify my argument here was that God and leprechauns have equal evidence. And so God could be powerful enough to create the universe. Sure. Leprechauns could be powerful enough to create the universe. So that's a parody. They have the same property. They both could be. There's no evidence either exists here. You're just saying that they let's could look, be powerful let's just enough. Forget about the leprechauns because you're insulting me. Number well, it's, one. It's not meant to number, number two is let's just stick with this idea. Could the universe come from an intelligent being other no let's put it this way can a universe come by itself which is a non sequitur to begin with because if you start with nothing how are you going to get to something which is right, the basic philosophical question okay so you tell me you tell me how this universe came into being it didn't it is always existing it doesn't need to be created and how did that happen I don't know. How did God come to existence without it? No, no, wait, wait. Don't put the burden on me. You answer your own question. Where did this eternal universe have the power to be eternal? Tell me. There's there's no logical contradiction. There's no evidence it couldn't be differently. So it's a pretty good conclusion. That doesn't that answer was. the question. That okay. doesn't answer the question. See, this is what you've been doing the whole night. You're escaping the direct questions to you by saying, well, it could have happened some other way or it didn't happen that other way. So that you think that justifies you. It doesn't. Now the burden is on you to tell me where this eternal universe came from or how it can re remain eternal, which is a, you know basically the same question. You tell me. Stop making excuses. Well, so I did. I gave you a possibility. And so that That's possibility... That is an answer. So again, you hold the burden of proof to because you're claiming God answer. exists. One, one sec. So you hold the burden of proof because you claim God exists, and you're saying God exists because of some feature of the universe. The universe exists. Now, for me to disprove that, all I need to do is show a different alternative that has equal evidence. So if I can say it's possible the universe is self-existing and has always existed. No, you haven't that, done that. One sec, one sec. And if that has equal evidence to God existing or more evidence, then that's a better explanation. It's not. And that disproves that your argument that because the universe exists, it's indicative of a God. So that's all I need to do here. Unless you can provide yeah. evidence of a God, yeah. all I have to do is show an alternative. That's you better. have to show me how this universe is eternal. And all, all, all you've done is try to escape that question by saying, well, uh, there's no other alternative that's going to beat my eternal universe. No, I want you to tell me how the universe can be eternal. Tell me that directly. What It's in its nature. Oh, well, what does that mean? All you're doing is moving it back one step. 
You tell me how it can be in its nature then. How, how it can be? That doesn't make any sense. Like sure if it, it has a property in how its does nature. The, how does the universe have an eternal nature? Um, because it's one of the properties in its nature. You're doing the same thing. Now you're saying, instead of nature, you're saying properties. Right. That's how properties work. So if you like, how is the round square round? That's that's a silly question. So if it there's is a, a silly thing, question. I didn't ask you a, that. I asked you how, your, you, how your universe that's is that. eternal. That's what I asked you. Asking how it's eternal is like asking how is a red ball red? If it has a no, property. You know the is, reason wait, I'm wait, asking wait, wait, that. Wait, no, I don't. You know I the really reason don't. I'm asking you that question. No, the reason I'm asking you that question is because that's not what happens. I don't and know what you that means. know that in your heart of hearts, that's not what happens. I have no idea what you mean right there. What, what, yes, what do you, you mean? Do. That's yes, not you what do. happens. You know no, what I, I mean. I genuinely don't. None of the people in my audience have any idea what you're talking about. They're literally saying we have no idea well, what you're you talking about. And, did you go and ask them all? Is yes, that, they're in the chat. Yeah. They're literally posting messages right now. Yeah, what is this guy talking atheists about? atheists like you. Okay. So they're already on your side. So that doesn't make, that's, doesn't I, move me. Okay. What we need is an explanation of your argument. What we need you to understand your argument. How your universe can be eternal all by itself. Tell me. Explain I, it to me. If it exists, it has properties. One of those properties may be eternality. Therefore, oh, maybe it is. It is. Maybe. Yes. Yes. Prove, that's it how. To me that, prove it to me how? that eternality is the property of this universe. Prove it to me. Is the pro I don't need to. All I need to do is say it's possible. I don't need to prove oh. it. Oh, oh, so so you think just because you all argue in possibilities, then you solve the problem? All you've done is yes. dig your hole deeper because you can't explain your own position. Wait, wait, wait. So, so again, the position here is that I can provide a better alternative than God. So all you're saying is, is God could be eternal by definition. And I'm saying the universe could be eternal by definition. Both of those are equal. So any argument no, well, make against my position. Be, One second. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. That's fine. I can claim that the universe must be eternal. It's just words coming out of my mouth. There's no evidence for that. So okay. your claim me, that God... One sec, one sec, let me finish the argument. So right. when you claim that God must be eternal, to me, it seems like equally as ridiculous if I said this potato must be eternal. It's an assertion with no evidence. So what is your evidence for God being eternal? And if you don't provide any, then I am equally justified in claiming the universe must be eternal because it's nothing but an assertion on both sides. All right. Let me let me attack it from a different angle because we're not getting anywhere on this one. Um, in you in looking at yourself and looking at me, um, like for example, you smiled probably about fifty different times during this whole interview we've had for what twenty minutes. Where does that smile come from? Um, neurology, biology. Oh, uh, could I throw in the per the word personality there? Does that have any? Sure. Okay, so um, you're trying to tell me or us that your human personality that laughs, has sorrow, has joy, is happy, is sad, is... Yeah, are you married? No. Okay. Um, do you have a girlfriend? Did you have, did you have a girlfriend? Yes. Okay. So you can have love, you can have mercy, you can care for someone... All these attributes of being human, um, where do they come from? And how, how would you regard them? What was the second part? How would I what? How would you regard them? Regard them? I don't know what that means. Well, I mean, do you just chalk them up to being, you know, one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball and producing this emotion I have called joy or mercy or compassion or love? Or yes, what? I don't. I think the only options are either it's deterministic forces or random, and I don't think they're random. So, yes, I think they're deterministic forces. Okay. So, basically, you don't really love your girlfriend. You you just basically uh, waited for some billiard ball to hit your brains, and it just happened to hit the right way, and you took her out to dinner, and you gave her flowers, and, uh, and you said niceties to her and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't really coming from your will, so to speak. That was like your personality. That was just another billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. Am I correct? Well, those are the same thing. My personality is a bunch of billiard balls. That is what love is. So it is both. Okay, brother. I feel sorry for you, brother. I really do. Okay. Because if that's the way you live your life, where you can 
think you love someone, but it's actually just a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. I, I, I pity you. I, I think you are the saddest creature that could possibly be on earth. Not to even, and, and then when you enjoy your love for your girlfriend, you don't even enjoy it because it's just another billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. You don't have any joy. You don't have any emotion, basically. Okay. And this is the, what I'm getting to is this the age old philosophical question that no philosopher has ever been able to answer. And that is, where does personality come from? What makes me different than a rock? Well, there's a lot that makes me different. I have well, I'm, not, I'm not quite following here. So to me, I don't see any difference between whether or not your emotions are produced by matter or if they're produced by spiritual stuff. Either oh, way, I know. there's that's, still... You know, what, I know. What, that's what, what, what's that? I'm getting to an argument here. So You don't have to reiterate it. I'm, not re I'm making an argument that I haven't made before. You haven't heard this argument before. So this argument is, is that it doesn't matter if your emotions are a result of physical brains or if they're a result of non-physical spirit there's still a result of deterministic processes either way. There's no, they're equally as real or equally as not real either way. It doesn't make a difference whether they're physical or non-physical. I don't see why you prioritize the non-physical here and say that it's must be more real. Oh, I, I wouldn't argue that my neurons play a part in the emotions I express or the joy I express, but to say that that's all that's behind them, that I don't have a soul or a spirit that is uh, animating those um, muscular reactions that I have in my body. Yeah, that's a totally different story. What, that, wasn't, that wasn't what I was arguing. So just to clarify. So I'm saying, imagine two people. One person is uh, all made of matter, nothing but matter. One person has a soul and they both experience love. They both experience humor and joy. One is determined by physical billiard balls in their brains and one is determined by spiritual billiard balls in their brains. What's the difference? The difference is the guy with matter that has a billion worlds isn't going to experience any emotion. Emotion is not, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That emotion is not one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. Okay. That's where you made me your mistake. Well, it's begging the question, but let's assume it was possible. Assume just hypothetical, because there's no logical contradiction here. So let's assume there's two universes, one made of nothing but matter with people who are made of nothing but matter. And they experience emotions, love, joy, sadness, happiness. And then there's a spiritual reality where a bunch of spiritual beings are and they experience love, joy, happiness, etc. Why would one be more real than the other without just assuming that they can't exist? Because that doesn't really... Because I'm not going to accept evidence. your hypothetical, that's why. I'm not okay. going to accept your hypothetical universe that has matter and emotions. I'm just not going to accept it. You can argue that way if you want, but you're not going to argue with me. Okay, so but that does means you don't have any evidence. You're just assuming it can't be the case. No, I'm telling you to look deep down in your heart, whether there's billiard balls down there or not, and recognize that you're different than, you know, a, a lion, a tiger, a, a monkey, a dog, a cat, because well, you they have, have emotions. Right, what? You, have, you have love, you have joy. Yeah, but they're primitive. They're not as advanced as ours. Okay, which again speaks to a creator who made animals uh, and he made man, but he distinguished them. Okay, so that's all my side of the fence, not yours. But wait um, a minute. If if animals have emotions, but they're not quite as advanced as ours, and animals don't have souls, doesn't that mean you can have emotions without souls? No, because animals do have souls. Oh, okay. So we're like animals then. We're not different from animals. No. Yeah. Well, we're like, we're different, you know, whatever side of the fence you want to be on and what you're looking at between an animal and a human, that's to be determined. The point is they're similar because they have a similar creator. Okay. The, the question you need to answer is where does emotion come from? You keep telling me it's billiard balls hitting Brain. billiard balls. Yes. Okay. You know, in your heart that that's not true. That there's more to you in your relationship with your girlfriend than a billiard ball hitting a billiard ball. Because if it was just billiard balls, then why take her out in the first place? What are you pursuing? Well, again, you, so, so I'm not understanding. Billiard ball hitting another billiard ball? Is that what you want to say? Oh, I'm not understanding your argument here. So my argument is apparently there's something within that sweet girl that you take out and and, and uh, say sweet nothings in her ear other than watching another billiard ball hit another billiard ball 
And if you're you tell me that, that doesn't help not, me understand your argument. So, so I'm let trying me to say understand because it it's very important. Well, repeating repeating very the important. words doesn't help. So, what I need is it that makes you go to your girlfriend and give her all kinds of good things that you think? Well, let's let's just call it affection, whatever love, whatever you want to call it. What makes you do that? What makes you call her up on the phone? And her say, nature hey, is my nature. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. This is very important. You you call her up on the phone and you say, hey, let's get together tonight. I we really would like to see you. And then at the end of the night, you have a couple of drinks and you get a little loose and you you kiss her and say, you know, I think I'm falling in love with you. I don't know. But you're very special to me, blah, 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 blah. Now, why do you go and pursue all that? Because of her nature and my nature. And it doesn't matter. If what does that mean? Or not her nature. What does that mean? It can mean whatever. Like it wouldn't make like again. So my argument here is there's no difference. You presented no evidence of any kind of a difference between physical love and spiritual love. You you've said nothing. Uh, that's not say, my wait, goal. Wait, 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 my goal wait, was to wait, talk to you. I'm making an argument. I'm making an argument here, trying you to understand yours. Arguing. So so my argument here is that you asserted that one of the evidences of God is that we have these emotions, and I'm claiming that okay, how is this evidence of a God? Because it seems like. All of these things can be explained by physics, which is the consensus in neurology, psychology, biology, chemistry, every field of physics, every field of cognitive science. It's all brain stuff. There's no evidence of spiritual stuff there. And you're claiming that it just cannot be the case simply because if I look into my heart hard enough, I will feel that there's no billiard balls. That's that's not evidence. I'm going to need something more than... I didn't say you won't feel there's no billiard balls. I'm asking you what motivates you to get in contact with this woman and have a relationship with her. And you're telling me, well, that's just the way we are. The emotions, yeah. which are a result of the billiard balls. The billiard balls produce the emotions. All of that yeah. is physical. But if it's just billiard balls, then why pursue it in the first place? Again, this what is, is she going to give you that a frog fallacy. wouldn't give you? It's a composition division fallacy. So again, the question is, what? what? Composition, composition division fallacy. So no, the question is. Don't give me that malarkey. I'm uh, asking you what makes you. I literally I answered your question. Listen, listen and, to the listen and, to the and, argument. And listen to the argument, then respond. Listen, stroke listen. her hair. Listen as, to as the argument. To, listen as to the argument. To that night, going to pick up a frog and looking at all the billiard balls. Uh, so again, listen to the, the arguments and try to respond to the arguments. So I am. The argument is no, you're not. You're not. You have to and like. What you're talking. trying to do you to is you're trying to categorize listen. my argument to bring it back to where you would like to to argue. I'm not going to let you do that. No, 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 no. I'm this, going to talk to you as a person. Argument. I'm going to have to mute I'm you. I'm going to ask you what the question, what the answer is to my question. I'm going to have to mute you if you don't makes listen you to the arguments. Have an affection toward your girlfriend and not the frog. Okay, so you need to listen to the argument. Try again. What is the difference between a bunch of matter producing love and a bunch of spiritual stuff producing love? If you cannot name a difference, then they're the exact same. There is equal value between the physical stuff and the spiritual stuff. So if you can build a house out of, say, bricks or you can build it out of, I don't know, mortar, either one would produce a house. And so what you make it out of, whether it's physical or non-physical, produces the same effects of love. So if I love my girlfriend, that can be purely a product of billiard balls, and it has equally as much value of whether or not it's a product of spiritual stuff. So until you can give evidence that one is more significant than the other for some reason, other than look into your heart and, and feel it, then you haven't provided evidence to why this is the case. Well, I'm trying to, but you won't let me. You keep trying to steer me away from the from the incision I'm trying to make in your personal being. And you're not going to do that anymore. Okay. I'm asking you, what makes you keep calling that girl up? I've answered this. Her, love. I love her. We need finish. You wanted to finish. I'm going to finish. I've answered your question four times. No, you haven't. You, that's why I keep asking you because you haven't answered it yet. Love you the answer is right. I love her. Categorize everything so that you can have a nice little tidy answer to it after you categorize it. I'm not going to let you do that. What? Okay, I'm going to ask you why you insist on contacting that girlfriend instead of going down and seeing the the, the frog at the zoo and watching his billiard balls move. I Tell love me. her. I don't love the frog. You love her. Yes. Well, 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 wow. Oh, wow. my answer four you times was correct. Her. Oh, my God. I you did answer. Her. Was that it all billiard physical. balls, though? Love, love is all billiard balls? Physical.
Huh? Done. Love is physical. It's a part of the brain. So I did answer your questions four times. It was sufficient. You lied. Yeah, and now, but, but, but you got why? yourself into a little trap here. No. Okay. So no, you're we're going back to my original question, which I asked you. Special about this girl. You love yes. her. Yes. Okay. Her nature. But, her physical now, you nature. Know, I want, here's what I want you to do tonight. I want you to go call her up and say, Laura, whatever your name is, guess what? I don't really love you because it's just a bunch of billiard balls hitting nope, in nope. my brain. Opposition division. No, makes... I'm going to mute you. You're muted. You're muted. So again, you need to explain why a bunch of billiard brawls producing love is somehow less legitimate than souls producing love. Why is love produced by billiard balls less real than love produced by souls? I have literally answered your question and brought up the exact literal critique you need to address to make your argument actually work as evidence. Why is billiard ball love less real than soul love? And if that guy turns off my mic again, this program is over. Okay. I see it up there. The host has muted your mic. Okay. You got that? Question. What, okay. What is this, is a, this is a debate. This is not where you get to turn me off and I have to listen to you. We are both in the same boat. You've spent more time talking. You to me. Talk what is the answer? I didn't say they were. What well, you? Did, what was the last sentence you just said? Because I just answered that and I forgot what I said. Tell so me again. My, yes. My question is, is what is the evidence that love produced by matter is less legitimate or less real than love produced by spiritual stuff? See, because what you're doing is you're putting it into your own categories. You're trying to tell me that matter can love. Matter yes, can't love. That's the whole point what? of my question. You Based, just keep what, what doing these hypotheticals so that you can get yourself out of this little trap that you got yourself into by saying that matter can love. What matter evidence? Can't love. Where where is the evidence of that? Oh, all of neurology on. says it you can. Where is your this, evidence? You keep play, You know exactly what I'm saying, but you keep playing this game. Like, well, show me somewhere where I can read about that, as what? if it's not already in your mind. You what? know that. Okay, okay, so I'm asking for You're evidence. You're telling me that a rock can love me just as well as your girlfriend can love me. If a rock had a brain, rocker. yes. Now, where is your evidence? Oh, you if a rock saying, had a brain. Okay, well, now we're making some movement. Because now it's just, it's not just matter. It's matter with some cognitive function up there right. that makes him a, a special being apart from a rock. Yes. Okay, so you will admit that much. Yes, it's a particular you pattern. Are special as opposed to a rock and his billiard balls. Yeah, yes. So the reason I love my girlfriend is because she is a particular combination or pattern in matter. It's not just any matter. It's not the the fact that I just love matter at random. What's it is there is a name? pattern in the matter. What's her name? Brenda. What's your girlfriend's name? What is Brenda? It? Yes, oh, Brenda. Brenda. Okay, I've known a few Brendas in my life. At any rate. Go tell Brenda tonight that, you know, I, I really don't love you. Here's what's happening, Brenda. Wait, wait. That's again, my begging the question. Your balls are hitting. And that's love. That's real love. That is real, true love. Well, wait a minute. What's real love as opposed to just love? What? The, the, the same thing. They're both the same word. What? Well, then why did you say real love? Because you said it wasn't real love. So I'm saying it is real love. Oh, okay. So real love is defined as what then? It is the process in reality that produces the thing called love, which is matter. Oh, so that's just basically what, what do they call that? You know, begging the question, you what? know, using as proof what you've already, you know, what you're trying to prove. In other words, you haven't really told me what love is. You just said it's something that happens and then love is produced. Well, what's the love? Uh, love is an emotion. And the thing that produces the emotion is what causes love. Well, yeah, you're doing, you're begging the question. Okay, you're is trying to use this proof, the very thing you're trying to prove. What? Tell me what love is without using love in the sentence. Love is an emotion. It is a process is in emotion. a cognitive space. Okay. And uh, is that an emotion like crying or um, laughing or what? What is, what is love as opposed to those emotions? Those aren't emotions. Those are physical reactions. But yes, sadness is an emotion like love. Yes. And, and humor is an emotion like love. Yes. Okay. Humor is an emotion. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So what, what is special then about love that distinguishes it from either humor or 
joy or whatever else, other emotion you have you mentioned it's a different patterned emotion it's not the same pattern different what does that mean different patterned where's the pattern coming from Where the brain huh the brain it comes from the brain okay so the brain's going to react differently to brenda your brain then yes. um john is going to react his his uh, emotions are going to react to brenda sure right okay yes so um what I'm so puzzled about, it, it, it's Tom, right? Yep. Yeah. What I'm so puzzled about, Tom, is that you can live in this world and and even to your girlfriend. I mean, I'm wondering what you're going to do on the day you're married. Are you, are you planning on marrying her? Maybe. Okay. Is when she says, you know, do you take her for better, for worse, for rich, for poor? And you go, I do. And, you know, kiss the bride and all this stuff. And, and basically you're just convincing yourself and maybe you haven't convinced brenda because if brenda knew this she'd be like she's also an atheist oh she's also an atheist so both of you are basically living in your perfect paradise of billiard balls bouncing off one another and the result is you guys get together yes we love each other and love is a real thing which is a result of matter you know all you're doing is bar you're living off of borrowed capital of those who actually believe in God because they know that all this stuff comes from God. It's not just billiard balls hitting billiard balls. Well, how do they know that? Enjoy yourself, Tom, you know, feel free to, to pretend that you're in love because a billiard ball is hitting a billiard ball and you know, you can go your way. I can go my way. And that's the end of this conversation as far as I'm concerned. Okay. But you need to explain how they know that. So knowledge is a justified true belief. How, who knows what? how the religious people know that love is more than billiard balls. So because they've already taken my advice and looking at Romans one, where St. Paul wrote that the invisible things of God are clearly known, clearly seen (laughs) in the things that are made. If you don't want to believe it, Tom, don't believe it. I don't care. You can't say they they know because you asked me to come on this program. I didn't ask you to come on my program. Okay. Apparently this is what I think. I think you're having trouble with your position and you want to see if you can knock down everybody that comes along so you can satisfy yourself that, well, I beat another one. And all you're doing basically is admitting what St. Paul says about people just like you, that they will refuse to believe by suppressing the truth. That's what you do. You suppress the truth. Because you know why? Because you don't want to answer to a God. That's why men don't want to believe God exists because they don't want to answer to him for their sins. I can understand that perfectly reasonable explanation. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, I just want to clarify. So I'm not actually arguing against God here. All I'm saying is I want your argument to have premise one, premise two conclusion. And your argument doesn't have premise one, premise two, and there's no conclusion. And so I'm trying to say your argument is following your premises, Tom. I don't follow your premises about billiard balls making me fall in love either. Okay. So again, again, premises. All I'm asking is for you to explain your argument a little bit further. So, so your argument was is that matter can't produce real love, only soul stuff can. And your evidence for this was look into your heart. And I was like, okay, do you have anything else other than look into your heart? Is there anything else that can actually be used to differentiate this feeling you have? No, Tom, just I'm being... not going to give it to you because if you can't look into your heart and see it, then you're not going to see it anywhere else either. Yeah. That's the problem with you. What? You have already decided you're not going to see it anywhere. Come on, man. You've been through enough of these debates to know that nobody's going to sh- lay down the red carpet for you and say, oh, here, Tom, walk down this way. This is how you're going to find all your answers. You know that's never going to happen. Well, they, they do. New, uh, Tom. It's all in so they, they do that. There's lots of people who do that. So like if, if, if I was asked, to. how do I know that you're the world is round? Because you're still an atheist. Well, so, so if people ask, like, how do I know the world is round? I say, well, you can take a ham radio and you can bounce radio signals off of the moon. I don't tell them to look into their heart. Like, no scientist is like, you know, you know how I know the moon is 2.5 or two, 250,000 kilometers away? Because I look into my heart. I just uh, look into my what? heart you're and I know. Tough. You just know. You just got to know. Like, oh, yeah. You can caricature it all you want, Tom, but it's how not going to change how anything. Is, how is that a caricature? Because, you know, uh, we, come That's on. literally what you said. It's not a caricature. Oh, 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 you know, all this stuff. Come on, Tom. Who are you for? And then, well, you, and then you, you said, just look into your heart. That's what you said. That was your entire argument. 
And then you go off on this scientific binge. Well, everything has to be a premise and a calculation and all this stuff. That's how I know the earth is round. Well, buddy, if that's what you think about the world, that it's just a scientific calculation, no wonder you're not having any fun. What? Okay? Well, I'm having a lot of Get fun right now. That. I don't know. And I don't know you, about you. This is, this is a lot of fun. Living. This, tell this, I'm having lots of fun. Because yeah, you're really right in love or not because the billiard ball sitting inside your neuron. <laughs> So, so for, for something to be knowledge, knowledge is defined as a justified true belief. And so for something to be a justified true belief, it has to be one, have premises that lead to the conclusion. If you can't do that, then it can't be justified. So for something to be knowledge, you have to have premises that lead to a conclusion. Uh, let me tell you something about knowledge. You know nothing. Okay? <laughs> you think you know a lot, but you know nothing. Okay? Uh, I know I exist. Cogito ergo sum. Oh, so, so wow. I, wow. So do I. So I, I don't you know nothing. Feel. You know why so they I had don't to know do nothing. That? They, they had to start all over again with philosophy because the first two philosophies failed. So that's why, we, that's, that's why we have to start. we have to start from the beginning somehow. I have to know I'm here. So I think therefore yes. I am. Then what do I do? Well, then I can reason things out. And what did yes. Descartes end up doing? He didn't reason out a thing that was that was absolutely firm that he could depend upon. And then you know Hume and Locke and uh, all these other guys came along and said, well, no, you do it this way, knowledge. No, you do it this way, experience. And then reason is the way. And then Kant came along and said, hey, none of you are right, because look, it's all in your head to begin with. So and that's when philosophy just went straight down to the ditch until we end up with existentialists like Sartre and Heidegger and all those guys who have no idea and they think life is absurd. I don't okay? know how that answers that the question. Is that where you want to end up? No, so, so you claimed you have knowledge that matter can't be soul stuff. And I'm claiming what are the premises and the conclusion that justify that um, as knowledge? Look, as far as I'm concerned, this conversation's over. Okay. <laughs> the burden is on you. You go to you, what? You think it's a joke? You go look into yourself and ask you ask yourself <laughs> why you love Brenda. And if you uh, think it's billiard balls, then I can't help you. I'm not the doctor that's going to be able to help you. I can only lead the horse to water. I can't make him drink. And well, that's well the help the help I'm looking for is evidence, logical premises, logical conclusion. And it seems I, like I, all you can Tom, provide I is all I'm look into say, your heart. Okay. The okay. evidence I'm going to leave you is I'm going to leave you in the dark. And you're going to have to figure it out yourself. Instead, <laughs> stop suppressing the evidence and start dealing with it. And sure. stop trying to categorize everybody's arguments. So, well, you didn't follow this procedure here, so I really can't answer you. Come on, Tom. We're men. If we went out and had a beer tonight. And, and really got down to the nitty gritty of who we are and what we're all about, you know, you'd stop this little categorization that you're trying to put what? everything into so that you can have an easy answer to it. That's what you're what? doing. You think I'm stupid? A little bit, but I think that my methodology is I use logic in order to construct a rational um, world. You don't have and logic. Wait, wait. So you I don't do. Have, I do. You, you, you don't. You have logic and knowledge. You don't. I'm telling you that. Well, I don't need you to assume You don't that. have logic. Yes, I do. No, why, you why would I not? Because I can see it. You don't have it. <laughs> you can see, right? you can see yeah, logic. This I can is, see I'm just, am I Your billiard it? balls are not correctly hitting the other billiard balls. <laughs> can I put it to you that way? Correctly hitting the other. Yeah. So so uh, my worldview is very simple. I start with cogito ergo. Um, sum. I, think I told you this conversation is over. I'm not going to argue that's it fine. again. That's fine. It's over. That's fine. It's seven, that's fine. It's I'm 645. That's I've got I'm just going to I'm going to mute you and like just talk to my audience then. So my worldview starts with cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am. And I use some kind of logical methodology to differentiate imagination from reality. Um, your methodology, I was just simply saying, look into your heart, doesn't differentiate imagination from reality. So your methodology is garbage. And mine, which uses novel testable predictions to differentiate between the two is good. So simply saying, look into your heart because you know it's true is a garbage argument. All right, that one was interesting. That one was interesting. I'm glad geocentrism would have been boring. This one was so much better than going to geocentrism. Um, but that was fun. All right. Thank you for the super chat, guys. I uh, didn't really get to him, but yeah, that was good. We didn't get to geocentrism. I don't, I don't, because he's he does geocentrism more often than the other ones than general theology. So I kind of wanted to explore just general theology with him was hilarious though. All right guys, snookered, yes. 
Uh, I'm out.